Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you for the last morning of this series. Um, I have truly enjoyed my visit with, uh, with all of you. I'm especially grateful to Peter and Charlotte and their family uh, for uh, having me here and going to such lengths to make sure that uh, I've been cared for. Uh, I thank Ernst for his uh, continuing attention to every detail of my visit. Um, I had wonderful meals, um, some incredible uh, help uh, has been provided. We had thoughtful service on every level. And I commend you, commend you heartily for the excellence of your service and for the manner in which I have been received. My trust is that the deposit of the word will continue to unpack in you long after I'm gone. I encourage you to listen to all the messages uh, together because I created, I mean, I spoke them with, uh, with an intentionality that they overlap and be cumulative. Uh, so although I had different sessions, one session in one location and the other here, and for all intents and purposes, I had different audiences. Nevertheless, I did not duplicate uh, the, the message from one session to another. And my hope is that you will get all of the messages because they are meant to be considered in their entirety. This morning is a bit of a summary of what I have, uh, have presented during these sessions. <coughs> One of the things that we labored to impart was the fact of the nature of man as understood from the heavens. We have only understood man from his fallenness. And so we understand him as a soul. In one of the sessions I talked about the, the, the manner in which the soul and the spirit are highly compatible. But the design was, from God's design, the design was that the soul should blindly follow the spirit. And when that occurs, the heavens reopen and we see things as they were meant to be seen. We see all things the way they, meant, they were meant to be seen. We see the earth the way it was meant to see, be seen. We see fellow human beings from the viewpoint of God. We even understand the scriptures from the viewpoint of heaven. And the domesticated version of the scriptures that we're used to, electing to understand what is written through reason, not through revelation, the thresholds are made so much higher when you understand from the, from the heavens what is said in the word. I talked about the very fact that when God made man, the creation was the creation that God made was a son. God made a son. And he installed within the son the nature of the father in the form of a spirit. So God gave man a spirit and a soul, put, putting the spirit and soul in a container of flesh or earth. Meaning that by this, God put both realms in one creation. God put heaven and earth in man. And God intended to feed man from both heaven and earth. When God made man, he knew what he had made and he knew that man required sustenance from both the earth and the heaven. And in one of the sessions, I talked about the creation itself. How when God, 
created the heavens and the earth, one of the things he did was he divided the waters from the waters. He didn't create the waters because when we understand water, there are two understandings of water. One is the physical water on the earth. The other is the water above the firmament. Now when we, when we, when we read about this in, in the book of Genesis, our natural inclination is to see the earth more or less, or to understand the picture more or less from the earth. But when God made the heavens and the earth, before he established the earth as we now know it, and before he established the heavens as we now know it, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface, over the surface of the waters. Which means that in whatever form we understand water, it was before the presence of God. And that before the earth itself was created. So God had an administration over the expanse. It's normal for us to think and to envision this as some construct relating to the creation itself. But this was in the beginning before there was a creation. So when God separated the waters from the waters, it is not to be understood that um, uh, he started with earth and did some things in earth and heaven. It is that whatever it was before him, it was before him. And so the nature then of water is to be understood in two uh, distinctions. One in the physical and one in the, in the spiritual. So water on the earth, we observed in one of the messages, water on the earth, when God separated the waters from the waters, they ended up being waters on the earth and waters in heaven. Now, immediately, if your mind goes to the idea of water in heaven, you think in terms of rain that comes from the heavens and falls upon the earth. It's quite different. The water of that kind is very different from the water in the physical world. In the natural world, what does water do? It cleanses. Water uh, irrigates, uh, water produces crops, and provide, as a consequence, bread is provided. All of that to attend the human being. It can wash the human being and, and re replenish you, clean you. You can drink it and be recharged. Uh, the food that comes as a result of rain serves the human body. But the water above the heavens does not exist as liquid. The water above the heavens exists as word. As word. And it is designed to do all those things. It is designed to wash it is designed to replenish, it is designed to produce food, and it is designed to be bread. There's this, and then there's this. Because the, the human being, in as much as he is both flesh and spirit, in as much as contained within this house, as Milton, the English poet, said, this house of mortal clay, both realms are installed, heaven and earth in the one person, then all of what is serves that which is within this one person. So, just like you have water to be washed, so the word washes. Husbands, love your wives, Paul would say in, to the uh, Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 22 and following. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
to make her holy, washing her by water through the word. So the word has a washing function and cleanses. The word is um, a, a cleansing agent. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, Titus says, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. And we're born again of water and of the Spirit. The cleansing that results in a renewed mind. So that we may have the mind of Christ. So when we are contaminated, when our thoughts are contaminated, the washing, the cleansing, just like when our bodies uh, uh, need to be bathed, so our, our spiritual man also needs to be bathed, to be refreshed, to be renewed, to be cleansed. And that occurs by the word. The washing of water through the word. That's why God established word in heaven and God established water in the earth. Now when the water comes into the earth from heaven, it also produces bread to eat so Jesus would say Jesus who is the word made flesh in the beginning was the word the word was with God the word was God the same was in the beginning with the father he made everything and without him was not anything made that was made and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth. So when the word comes, the bread, when, when, when the word comes, it is bread. It is bread. Jesus, the word would say, I am the bread of life. Come down from heaven. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. So he compares natural food to spiritual food. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and have perished. But I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. In, in, and, and regarding this word, if our spirits are going to be nourished so that we grow up into the fullness of the stature that belongs to Christ, then we cannot live on natural bread alone. We live then by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God because the word is spirit and it produces life. And that life is the light of men. That life is resurrected life, so it is eternal. It draws its source of being from the realm of the eternal. So in him we have life because we've eaten of the bread of heaven. He connects the bread and the water when he tells the woman at the well that if, he knew, if she knew who asked him for water, she would ask in turn that he would give her the water that produces eternal life, that springs up into eternal life. So that's, that and much more is meant by that single statement in Genesis that says, and God separated the waters from the waters. You see? That there was water above the firmament and water below the firmament. The water below the firmament is in the natural world. And it's useful for all the things that the human being requires in this life. The water above the firmament is uh, that, that exists as bread and when it comes to the earth, it comes not as physical rain but as grace. As grace. Grace and truth are the components of this word. Grace, you see, is the economy of God to sustain the truth from heaven. So we do not just get 
new revelation and new insight, it, the, the word that comes, comes as grace and truth. Grace is the economy that supports the truth. Because, you see, the truth is not just what you know by reason. The truth transcends reason. And it requires an act of faith to lay hold of it, to believe it, and to inhabit it. If there is no economy that supports it, then it does not, it is not effective. So the, the economies of grace naturally come with the component of the revealing of the eternal in time, which is the truth. Now, Jesus took to himself the descriptions of bread, of water, and of truth. Because they're all the composites, they're all the components of that which feeds the human spirit. Truth, any time truth is spoken, it is a revealing of the person of Christ. There are things that are true, but then there is the truth. The truth is always a person because he is the standard of God. That is why he is the truth. He's, he's called the firstborn. The firstborn. And yet we know that Adam was the firstborn. We know the first man was Adam. There's a first man and a last man. The word in Hebrew for man is the word Adam. It means simultaneously the genus called man and the person known as Adam who had a proper name which was Adam. The first of the species was Adam the man. The last of man is Christ. So there's a man from the earth and there's a man from heaven. Indeed, as you have borne the likeness of the man from earth, so you shall also bear the likeness of the man from heaven. But it's a mystery. It's a mystery. It means that it requires uh, revelation. So this person who is the firstborn is actually the lastborn of the two. How, do we under, how are we to understand that? Well, the word firstborn in the scriptures is the term primo genitor. Primo genitor. There's progenitor, which is the father, and there's primo, which is, you get the term primary. So when children go to primary school, they go to first school. It's the first encounter with school. So primary means first. Primogenitor means first of the generations. Right? The first of the generations. Jesus is said to be the primogenitor and the word firstborn actually comes from this. It's the translation of the word primo. Genitor. But we know Adam was the first to come and is the first of the human generations. He was the first born of God. Adam was the son of God. So uh, uh, um, uh, Luke chapter 3, the very end of the, of the chapter that recounts the genealogy of Jesus, describes Adam as the son of God. So then in what sense is Jesus the primogenitor, though he comes last. Well, the firstborn, if we did not understand there's time and then there's the eternal, we would not understand how Jesus could be the firstborn if Adam was actually the first to appear in time. The firstborn in time is the first from the womb. Right? The firstborn in the eternal is the first in rank. The first in rank. And it means that he is the one 
who is the most like the Father. So he is the standard. He is the template. Whenever he comes into the earth, he will restore the vision of the Father because he is the most authentically like the Father. Okay? He's the firstborn in rank. So whenever you've deviated from the standard, you don't need the firstborn in time to come again. When you've deviated from the standard, you need for the restoration of the standard to be returned. You need that the standard should be returned to reset the genus. So you have not come to Mount Sinai, which was when Moses was there and the Lord descended on it, it bellowed with smoke and dark and thick darkness. You didn't come to that resetting. You have come to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. You've been brought back to the standard of truth. When he came, he came to be the standard of the truth. That is why he would say, I am the truth. I am the truth. I am the most like the Father. If you see me, the vision of the Father will be restored to you. The authentic vision of the Father will come again to you. So all truth, all truth, all things that are true, are reflections of that standard in its various permutations, in all the diversities out of which you may see the appearing of the truth. But truth itself is a person. And that person comes with grace to sustain the truth that he has come to embody himself. So when he when he stood among us, we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. He is the archetype. He is the one after whom the pattern comes. He is the patent son. Now this patent son came in human flesh, but he carried the spirit of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Because man had deviated, because man had fallen away from the standard of righteousness and truth, it was necessary for God to restore the standard. And that spirit, who is the standard of God, that spirit in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells, that spirit is called Christ. He is the firstborn. He is, the, he is exalted because, not because we say, I exalt you, I exalt you. That's just you recognizing who he is. You don't do anything for him by saying, I exalt you, I exalt you. You're catching a vision of who he is as he is. And that's nice for you. Doesn't change anything for him. Okay. <laughs> he is as he is. He is as he is. And when you're assembled to him, the manner of your being assembled to him assures that you are now connected when you become the body of Christ. When you be, the body of Christ is a many-membered body, 1 Corinthians 12. When you're assembled to him, you don't do anything for him. What you are is you are infused with the standard that he already is. And wherever you go in the world, that standard is presented in your person. You cannot be assembled to him 
and have a different standard. So all of your sufferings are about adjusting your vision and changing your perspectives to coincide with his, with who he is. Now, having said all of that, and the deposit of these messages, some of the things that it will produce is a different way of understanding the scriptures. From, from now on, I am convinced that all of, you, all of you who will give ear to what the Spirit has spoken in these messages, you'll begin to experience the opening of the scriptures. Because you will begin to see the scriptures not from the domesticated point of view of reason, but from revelation in which they disclose in every line of scripture, discloses the heavenly realms where you are seated in Christ Jesus while you function here in the world. So I want to take you back to the scriptures and uh, have a message this morning. All of that was just introduction. <laughs> and some of it was just free stuff. I want to take you back to a story you have read many, many times, I'm sure. It's found in the book of uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 1. That's where we'll start. It's the first miracle that Jesus performed. The first contains all the elements of what will follow. It is the nature of first. It contains the elements that will follow. And they'll be unpacked as you go, but the introduction usually contains all the elements of the story. That's why I chose it this morning, to illustrate water and water. How you see from the viewpoint of the earth, how you see from the viewpoint of heaven. Now it says, on the third day, well, I'll read the story first, and then we'll come back and, uh, and deconstruct it in the time remaining. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding feast at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the, water, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, he said, This is Baya Lekka. <laughs> <laughs> Lekka, lekka. <laughs> Let, suddenly the Afrikaans came up on my... <laughs> <laughs> when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, 
The servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. So, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. This story begins after some prior events had occurred. So let's go back to the event of Jesus being baptized by John in the River Jordan, which is in the previous chapter. Now, the change that occurred when Jesus was baptized by John in the River Jordan was summarized when God himself spoke out of the heavens. God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove as God spoke out of heaven. Now what was going on here? Jesus came to John to be baptized. John recognized him as he came. And John said, Jesus said to him, baptize me. And John said, I have a need to be baptized of you, and yet you come to me to be baptized. Now, what is that all about? Jesus said, allow it to be so now, because it, it is incumbent on you and me to fulfill the requirements of righteousness. What is that all about? What? Why does Jesus come to John? Because John, you see, is a qualified Levitical priest. His father is Zechariah. Zechariah was officiating, offering the sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, when the angel appeared to him and told him that his wife Elizabeth would be with child. And John was so overcome, John was dumb, or could not speak from that point on. So we know that John's father, Zechariah, was a qualified Levitical priest, qualified to offer the sacrifice. How did you become a priest under the order of Levi? By your ancestry. So because John's father, Zechariah, was a priest, John was a qualified priest. Now John could have contaminated himself and thus disqualified himself from a function, becoming a functioning priest. But he was not that. In fact, he was even more qualified than his father. Why? Because he took a vow of the Nazarite, which was a super clean person. So John was not just a priest qualified under the Levitical order. He was a super priest. Why would God allow that? Because John was the one who was required to examine the sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The, the priest had three duties to, to the sacrifice. The first was to examine the sacrifice. The second was to wash the sacrifice so it could be offered. And the third was to offer the sacrifice. The Lamb of God came to the super priest 
because this was under the law. And he said to him, wash me. Because John had already said, behold the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. The priest had examined the lamb and found that he was without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And Jesus said to the priest, now wash me so that I may be sacrificed. And John said, no, no, I can't do that. You come from a greater order than I. You're from the order of Melchizedek. I am just from the order of Levi. But Jesus responded by saying, for now we are under the order of Levi. I was born, under, I was born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. So it is incumbent on you and me to fulfill what is required by the law. And so John baptized him. When he comes up out of the water, now baptism is a symbol of burial. Is it not? Yes. Uh, Romans 6 says, we are therefore buried by baptism into death. So that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so also we should walk in the newness of life. Because if we've been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man of sin has been crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that from now on we should not serve sin. Because he who is in the flesh is a slave to sin. But he who has died is freed from sin. So baptism is a, is a symbolic way of putting to death the natural man to give way to the arising of the spiritual man. And it's resetting our relationship to God. So when John baptized him, the Son of Man was buried, and what came up was the Son of God. And heaven opened, and God said, this is my Son. So that had happened in the time before the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. As the Son of God, he was taken up to confront the devil immediately after his baptism. Right after he was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And what we get to see, what we get to see about the Son of God is how he has overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, which is the cosmos. So when Satan comes, when he meets with Satan, the purpose is to disclose that he is now, in truth, the Son of God. Not just, not just on the account that God had said it um, in, in, the, in the fashion of being nice to him or in the fashion of approving of him, he had actually become functionally capable of representing his father in time. He had come full of grace and truth. And now God meant to display him as the patent son. The one who was not governed by the flesh. The one who was not subject to the rule of the world. And the one who was not under the dominion of Satan. The three temptations establish that reality beyond any possibility of doubt. Because he's tempted with bread. He's hungry. Forty days in the wilderness will produce a ravenous hunger for just food. He is at the optimum point where he could be tempted 
to, div to, to revert to the imperatives of his flesh. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Where was Jesus when he was taken up by the Spirit? Into the wilderness. So he reconnects to the history of the Jews for a continuity of the story. Their, his fathers, his natural fathers, ate manna in the wilderness and perished. But he is the bread of life come down from heaven. Is the spiritual greater than the natural? Ought the natural be submitted to the spirit? That was the test. And Jesus was, when he was tempted by Satan to turn stones into bread, he said, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, because that's bread for your spirit. That is bread for your spirit. And the spirit has life in himself, whereas the flesh profiteth nothing. And he showed that hunger had to submit to bread from heaven. Bread from heaven is the total food and it'll sustain even your bodies in times of hunger. The higher order predominates and the lower order uh, is contained in the higher order. And he showed us that his choice was to be the new man, the newly revealed man, not governed by the imperatives of his soul. I don't have time to unpack the other two temptations, but look at, it through the, look at those temptations through the paradigm of the spirit man over the man of soul, over the man of flesh. And you will see that the intent of God was to show us that what he had declared, this is my son, was the reality. The natural man had died and been resurrected as a spiritual man and he was put on display in the three temptations. When he comes back out of the wilderness now, when John comes back out, or when Jesus comes back out of the wilderness now, the first of the days, John again said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he later testified, I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize said, the one on whom you see the Holy Spirit descend and remain, he it is who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His, the fan is in his hand. He will purge the threshing floor. He will gather in the harvest. And so John was the one who was called the spirit of Elijah because he recognized the one who would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to, in the natural to foreshadow that this was the season when God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself because he is the father and we were created as his sons. So now he comes to the wedding feast on the third day. The second day he gathers his disciples and they're with him now at the wedding feast. <clears throat> so let's look at this. On the third day there was a wedding feast at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. View this passage from representations. The duality of water and water. The heavens, the heavens and the earth. There's a way to understand this story from a domesticated point of view. And there's a way to understand the story from heaven. Because this is a setup. Just like the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness... This was the first of his miracles and it was a sign, it said. So it is pregnant with the hidden message. 
and his mother was there. Jesus also was there, was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So it's a wedding feast. It's a wedding feast. It's the beginning of the time. A wedding feast was over several days. It is the beginning of the time of the marriage of the Lamb. The wedding feast is a type and shadow of the marriage of the Lamb. It's a time of reconciliation between God and man. This, the, the first thing Jesus did in his ministry was to head toward reconciling God and man. And the wedding, the wedding feast is that. From the beginning it was so. Because God took from the open side of the first man, God took a woman and showed that the woman was in the man. And the second man whose side would be opened is the very one we're studying at the moment. And his side also would be opened, and that which was taken out of the first may be reinserted into the second. <laughs> Type and shadow. And that whole event is pictured as a wedding, as a marriage. So God is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. There has been opened to God a new and living way through the veil that is to say his flesh. And that which was taken out might be reinserted because no man comes to the Father but by me. Unless you are in me, I have no part of you. And you come to God in Christ as a bride in the husband. So it was a wedding feast as opposed to a sermon on the mount that began the ministry of Jesus. Very clear that this would be his paradigm. He would go toward the marriage. He was there with his disciples. That means he was there in the corporate man. The things that are about to happen will not happen just with Jesus alone. It'll happen with those whom he would send. Because we are blessed when we believe in the words of the ones he has sent. Blessed are they who will receive the word by those whom I have sent. And Jesus prayed for these 12 whom he was about to send and for us in them. Whoever will receive the word through them, he said. I'm praying not only for these 12, but I'm praying for all those who will receive my word through them. So the corporate man is present at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And his mother is there. So who is his mother? What does that represent about his mother? Let's look at something about the mother. His mother is the law. His mother is there to represent the law. Look at Galatians chapter uh, 4, uh, verse 17, I believe. Verse 21. Galatians 4, 21 says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now who was Mary? The mother of his flesh. Mary was not the mother of God. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Now it is true that Jesus is God, but Mary is not the mother of his godhood. Mary is the mother of his humanity. One the slave woman born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. 
Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. It says that. These women are two covenants. Now, here are the two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery, and she is Hagar. So the law from Mount Sinai is Hagar. That's the mother of the flesh. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. And so on. I could unpack more of that, but I won't. So the point is that his mother was there, and she is there in the capacity of the law. Now, when the law, when the, when it's, when the law and the spirit are together in one place, the law has to admit that it does not possess the spirit. Wine is a type of the spirit. It produces gladness. It produces rejoicing. It produces joy. In the presence of the new, the old has to say, we've run out of wine. We have run out of wine and there's nothing we can do to produce more wine. The wedding cannot be supplied with the joy of the wedding. What is a wedding feast without joy? And the woman said, uh, the mother said, as the law, the woman said, we have no more wine. We have no more wine. The law had run its course because now the spirit had come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with you and me? I want to read that passage from, an old, from, a, from Young's literal translation of the Bible. This is what it says. Wine they have not, Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, she said. Wine they have not, she said. Jesus saith to her, what to me and to thee, woman? What it, what it means is, is this. Let me go back to where we were now. I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back to, to where we were. Uh, The implication is, Jesus said to her, Woman, do you understand that this situation in which we now are has to do with you and me? He's saying we are here together in this situation because it's about you and me. It's about what we represent, both in the flesh and in the spirit. You are my natural mother. I am the son of God. You are the law in representation. I am the spirit in representation. And you, have re you represent that which has run out of wine. Now, So, <laughs> then, the, then his mother said, let me go back to the, uh, to the version that we've been reading. Then his mother said this remarkable thing. Understanding that the one is greater than the other, what does his mother say? Whatever he tells you, 
This would be like John the Baptist saying, I must decrease while he increases. This is the place where Mary lets go of him. Because she realizes that he is sufficient for the hour and her place is under him. Whatever he tells you, do. She's speaking here in the language of Moses. It's recorded in Acts 3.22, a quote from Deuteronomy, where Moses said, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up from among the people like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall command you. And it shall come to pass that the soul that will not listen to this prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So Moses prophesied this event. Whatever he tells you to do, do. The mother is representation of the whole standard that is embodied in Moses. And face now with the spirit at the wedding feast of the Lamb, Moses says, through his mother, whatever he tells you, do, because he is the one. And Jesus said, Jesus takes over. Otherwise, and I know you've, you've puzzled a long time over the question, but was Jesus being insulting to his mother? Not at all. Not at all. See, Translators often do not understand, so they put the thing in the language, or it, they put the expression in what makes sense in their minds. That's why I went back and I read you from a literal translation, which is Young's literal translation, and, and where, he, where he shows us, with me and thee, this has to do. With you and me. This has to do. Do you understand, in other words, that this has to do with you and me? I promise you, most translators have not understood what is going on here. They just understand the domesticated version of the scriptures. That's why rain, when it comes out of heaven, is not understood as rain as bread. That's why we don't understand such things as water above the firmament and water below the firmament. We domesticate it to make water above the firmament rain that, that falls out of heaven, as opposed to the bread that come, word which comes in the form of carriers of grace who bring that word to the earth and it is bread to feed the human spirit. If you don't, you could translate the words because you know the Greek and the Hebrew. But if you don't understand what they mean, then you will domesticate it in the way you present it. So, Jesus said to them, or Mary says to them, do whatever he tells you. Now, verse 6, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Six is the number of man. He was created on the sixth day. The book of Revelation speaks of the triple six and calls it the number of a man. Six is the number of man. So the six stone jars represent humans who, have, who in their relationship to God have only been used for ceremonial purposes. They stand before God as religious people. They don't understand God. They're used for washing, for, for cleansing, and so on. Types and shadows, rituals. So when you have humans who are religious, when you have the human community described as the six stone water jars, who only know God through religious activities, 
What they need is water from heaven. Fill the water jars with water. This is the one who is the water himself saying, fill them up, and they fill them to the brim, which means there was no place for a mixture. Now, what happens when a ceremonial religious person becomes filled with the spirit of revelation? It renews his mind. It changes his mindset. It washes his conscience. It cleanses him from acts that lead to death. He experiences a transformation of being when water comes into his vessel. And he's filled to the brim. And we know the transformation has taken place in him because what he says and does after that is different. So they draw out what used to be water, what used to be ceremonial, but it has now produced wine. In fact, it doesn't just produce wine, it's produced the best wine. You take someone of ordinary standing, fill that person with the spirit of God, with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge and understanding, and they will say of ignorant and unlearned men, what meaneth this? Are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear in them the wonderful works of God. There used to be just ceremonial jars that stood in the places of religion. But now, now, when from heaven has come the revealing of the word, now there's a renewing of their minds. And when you hear from them again, fishermen, farmers, ordinary people, speak the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven into their spheres. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Six stone water jars filled to the brim. When you draw it out, it is the best wine. It is not just wine, it is the best wine. And no longer is the feast absent of wine. The joy is returned. Indeed, the greatest joy is returned to the house of God. Return to humanity. We carry the presence of Christ with us. And when people taste and see they taste and see the life of Christ in us. For Christ becomes our lives. And when he who is our lives appear, he appears with us. And men will see the goodness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And they're looking into your faces. The world is about to recognize that God has kept the best wine for last. Remember what I said to you from here in the Cape. Remember what I said to the Cullens. What is your destiny as black and white? to model reconciliation because in you already are both races dwelling peacefully. When this wine is drawn out and presented to the community, 
they will wonder, what meaneth this? Who are these people who were once thought to be not white enough and not black enough? Who are these people that show us the grace of God for mankind? Who are these people who live comfortably with both black and white? You are configured this way because God saved the best wine for last. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up and to establish you among the sanctified. You're being established by the word. May grace, mercy, and peace be with you always.